Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, Conserving Brittany, Part Two, The Internal Affairs of a Conservatorship. My name is Debbie Kesey, and I, along with Matt Kanan and Stephen Beltran, will be the moderators for today's presentation. Today's program is being recorded by the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Unauthorized recordings are prohibited. The Beverly Hills Bar Association, LA County Bar, Orange County Bar, San Fernando Valley Bar, and the South Bay Bar Associations are very happy to offer all attendees two free CLE credits as a public service to help everyone understand the internal workings of conservatorships a little better. The certificates will be emailed after, within 24 hours after the program, and the materials have already been sent to you through a PDF link. Again, viewers may submit their questions through the Q&A button. And the panel will not be discussing the specifics of the Britney Spears case in accordance with Canon 3B9 of the California Code of Judicial Ethics. In your materials, you have the bios of our panelists, so I will just make a brief introduction. Uh, please welcome the Honorable Maria E. Stratton from the Second District Court of Appeal, Division 8. The Honorable Mary House from the Alternative Resolution Centers and previously from the LA Superior Court. The Honorable Kim Hubbard from the, uh, sorry, from the Superior Court of Orange County Probate Division. Attorney Lawrence Lebowski, a certified specialist in estate planning, trusts and probate. And Attorney Gavin Wasserman, who would like you all to call your county supervisor or legislator and demand more beds be made available for persons with mental health issues. Okay, so in part one, the panel discussed what conservatorships are, the qualifications of CACs, what medical evidence is required, and how the court evaluates such evidence. Today, in part two, the panel will discuss how to avoid conservatorships, why and when we still need them, the concept of court supervision, how conservatorships can be modified and terminated, and the differences between an LPS and a probate conservatorship. So Judge House and Judge Hubbard, would you please begin our discussion on how people can avoid conservatorships and the why and when sometimes we still need them? Uh, certainly. You can do appropriate estate planning that may well obviate the need for a conservatorship, whether it's by way of advanced healthcare directive, power of attorney, trusts, these are documents that can greatly assist. And if done with a viewpoint towards family dysfunction and what dysfunction exists, they may well be fine and there will never be a need for a conservatorship. But what most people don't look at is family dysfunction. So what I'd like you to do is consider this from the point of view of saying that normal doesn't exist. Normal is an artificial construct. I have never seen a family that did not have stressors, that did not have tensions between certain family members. Those stressors, those tensions can blow all of this up. And very quickly, I just wanna tell you that many years ago, we used to tell people, you didn't wanna go through probate. You didn't want to do accountings. You didn't want to post a bond. You didn't want to tell the court everything that you had to do. The court telling you, do a trust. You can avoid probate. But what I'll tell you is that trust litigation expanded about 100% because of family issues. Most people know. Could we see the next slide, please? Most people know that there are some issues in their family. Now they don't discuss them and very often they don't disclose them, but they must because if you don't do this correctly, then you have blended families as we see here. Often you're going to see the children from the first marriage contesting any kind of estate planning documents. If the wife who is the second marriage gets what they consider to be too much the younger husband or wife, the current live-in, there are huge areas here that we can look at. But one of them is where siblings look at each other and say, well, mom always liked you best. <laughs> you always got more. I'm the oldest, I should be put in charge. Well, I'm the youngest, I love them the most and I stayed at home. These things will always come out and actually cause tremendous problems. So a very 
measured and careful look at the family and how the family operates is necessary before those estate planning documents will be successful. Judge House, I know you have more examples. Well, yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely. Um, what I find happens is the higher the dysfunction of the family, the greater problems we have to deal with as judicial officers. You know, a lot of times I felt like I was more psychologist than judge because I would try to figure out, well, what are the motivations of these siblings? And uh, sometimes I could learn about them when we had a trial and they took the witness stand. Um, uh, these situations are very emotional. Uh, you know, I've had siblings talk about, well, my brothers never liked me. He threw me in the swimming pool when I was three years old and I almost drowned. I mean, these are long, deep seated resentments and perceptions by children that mom or dad love them best or, or love them least. Um, so, you know, those rise up. Uh, and since we're talking about conservatorships, I'll, I'll talk about it in that context. Um, you know, a lot of siblings who live out of state will come in and think mom and dad are fine. I mean, they're, they're living, you know, on that uh, river in Egypt, denial, all right? Uh, so that it makes it difficult to find a proper solution for this dysfunctional family. Uh, to many, in, in many respects, I sort of blame the, the, the heads of the families, the mothers, the fathers, the domestic partners, the same-sex partners in, in marriage for not educating their children about what they're going to do or what they want to do with their lives. Um, how they, you know, if you go to the next slide, I remember as a small child, the next slide, please. I, rem no, the, the, I remember as a small child, my grandmother, no, go back, go back, dysfunctional family. I remember as a small child uh, hearing my grandmother say to my mother, if you ever put me in one of those homes, just put the pillow over my face. All right. So you have children that have, you know, a closer bond with their family members who feel they know them better. You have those who are the oldest. Um, I don't know about you, Judge Hubbard, but I saw another trend of dysfunction is like the the 70-year-old uh, parents trying to conserve the 90-year-old parents and the 50-year-old grandchildren complaining that both their mother and father and their grandparents were spending all of their inheritance. All right. Well, of course, we come back, as you well know, and agree to that statement of nobody's entitled to an inheritance. They need to get over it. And, and then you have, for example, um, you know, the younger children or the returning adult to the home that may have substance abuse problems and the perception that they are exerting undue influence on their parents or their one parent and then the, the other siblings swarming. Um, so when you're dealing with an older adult, that is an issue. The second issue that I think really ought to be stressed is when you have a limited conservatorship, and if you'll remember, limited conservatorships are for basically developmentally disabled adults. And um, I had a very, very uh, difficult case where in the family law court, before the conservatee became an adult as a minor, this poor child, high functioning autism, was being shuttled back and forth between the parents in the custody battle. Everybody thought, great, he becomes an adult, we won't have that issue, but it just translated into probate court. And this high functioning adult also made money, um, had, a, had a job uh, through the regional center, um, and the parents were fighting over what the child was making and what they should get. Um, and it, it, was, it was like replaying the family law role um, in, the, in the, uh, the probate court. So uh, dysfunction is at the root of all of the, I believe, Judge Hubbard, you can disagree with me, but dysfunction is at the root of all of the probate trust contests, particularly in conservatorships and in trust contests. Absolutely I agree. I can't fathom it's not anything but that because if everyone were quote unquote reasonable they'd sit down at a table and decide let's do what's best for mom or dad or or my autistic brother or my developmentally disabled down syndrome uh, sister but they don't 
uh, there, there's turf wars, um, there's fighting, infighting, and it, it is truly a sad event when families who should know each other better turn it over to you or to me um, to decide how they're going to live their lives. And I think we should also just mention that there's a great many of those children who come back home with uh, substance abuse issues. Many of them are self-medicating. There's an underlying mental health issue. An awful lot of the people that we see. I agree. I agree. So it's, it's really a systemic problem um, that unfortunately the most vulnerable person in that whole family, familiar relationship is the one that gets harmed the most. That's the aging parent with dementia or other health issues. It's the, uh, the developing disabled person who should have uh, greater freedoms, uh, perhaps if, if in the right environment. And um, unfortunately they come to the court system to sort that out. We should probably also say that there are many families out there who are able to work these things out. There are many families out there who I still think have an element of dysfunction, but it's mild and they are able to discuss and work these things out. Remember, we only see those folks who can't work it out where there's going to be a problem. There seem to be an awful lot of them. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I read an article years ago uh, in Money Magazine where the writer really, really encouraged the parents to sit down with the children and have that difficult talk. And in some respects, it was more difficult than to talk about the birds and the bees, all right? Because what they're trying to do is talk about the finances they have, how they plan to live their retirement, what kind of medical decisions they want made for them if they become incapable. Um, they have a power of attorney and they could, should explain why they're doing it. Uh, but you don't, I think those are the families we don't see. Don't you think, Judge Hubbard? I believe so, yes. So... Do, do any of the moderators have any questions for us? I will just support your comment, Judge House, uh, 100% that this is an extremely difficult conversation, but you've got to have it. Or if it's all kept secret, again, this is where we see problems. They got this by undue influence. It might have nothing to do with it, but the parents don't want to tell them and the parents don't want to have the discussion, too, because they're talking about their own incapacity and their own deaths. And we really don't like talking about those things, especially when it's going to be us. It's, it's difficult all around, but it really should be done. I, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later when I mention advanced health care directives. But um, one of those, you, you can nominate a conservator if you become incapacitated through an advanced health care directive. You don't have to have your family go through the expense of the conservatorship. And you also can, um, uh, you know, actually um, make sure it's in writing what your wishes are. Uh, because that way a health care provider will follow those or a power of attorney will be required to follow those. Um, in the event uh, that it's triggered that you that those circumstances exist for that power to be exercised. And um, I know it's difficult to talk about one's death and it's difficult to talk about that with one's children. Um, but it's really, really critical that that be done because otherwise you're right, everybody's in court and sorting it out with people who don't have um, who, I, I'll give it a personal example. Uh, my only divorce, I was not right-minded, okay? Because um, it was so emotional. It was so difficult to uh, deal with all of those issues. And I wasn't listening very well. And that's the kind of emotional dysfunction we see in the courtroom. A lot of times it doesn't matter what we say or do, people aren't listening because that they have that emotional wall um, to where they're not able to comprehend what the consequences are. I think the, the uh, most difficult cases I've ever had, even on civil and in probate, are when the phrase is uttered, well, it's the principle of the thing. Yeah. Judges, uh, Hubbard I, and uh, House, you're talking about dysfunction, and if I can ask you to comment on the uh, application of domestic violence restraining orders and elder abuse restraining orders at this point, I think it has some relevancy. 
Well, I can certainly talk about the elder abuse restraining orders. I do them for our court. Um, these are in situations where the elder themselves has been abused. Uh, it can be actually by anyone. Obviously, it's most often family that's accused of being the abusers. It can be neighbors. It can be friends. For that matter, it can be strangers. You don't have that availability with domestic violence restraining orders. There are certain circumstances that there is an intimate relationship, uh, a cohabitant, a husband, um, child. Uh, that has to qualify. Elder abuse is a little more open than that and, of course, also includes dependent adult abuse. However, these are not vehicles to stand in the place of a temporary conservatorship should that be necessary because the elder has to want the restraining order. We see a lot of instances where there's a filing by, say, a son or a daughter, grandson, granddaughter, niece, nephew, whoever it is, accusing another family member and saying they're doing it on behalf of the elder. We then determine the elder doesn't want it. If they don't want it, it's not going to get granted. We're not going to set a respondent up to be arrested, which is all we're doing at that point. So the elder must want it. And I've had so many people say, but they're being abused, you have to grant this. No, if they don't want it, your remedy is temporary conservatorship. It is not a restraining order. Restraining orders also cannot be used as a uh, vehicle to do landlord tenant when there actually needs to be an eviction. We see a lot of those now. So they can be used improperly, but if used properly, we can get protection so that perhaps other actions can be filed, uh, other matters taken care of once you have the abuser out of the household. You can do that with domestic violence, but again, the rules are a little bit different. And in both domestic violence and in elder abuse, independent adult abuse, the standard is preponderance of the evidence. The very lowest standard we have in law. It's more likely than not that the conduct occurred. So it's a very low standard. It can be very effective, but not if used for the wrong purpose. Good job. <laughs> And I think it's important to translate that into when you seek a, even a temporary conservatorship that ultimately may become a permanent one, the standard is clear and convincing evidence that the, the elder or the developmentally disabled adult uh, needs to have uh, a conservatorship. So um, yes, the standard's lower, but the requirements are very different and they're temporary and they are actually dependent, as you have said, Judge Hubbard, on the adult or the uh, development disabled adult, to, the elder or that adult, to want it to happen. And just like you have in domestic violence situations, you have a fair amount of recanting witnesses. Uh, you know, maybe maybe a son did strike his, his elderly mother, but she doesn't want to see him go to jail. Exactly. So she, she backtracks. So they are not a remedy in, in many, in any respect. Um, uh, they might put that particular family and that dynamic um, on the, the flag, red flag warnings for the local police department so that there's maybe additional health checks and those kinds of things. But, um, you know, if you really have that sort of scenario going on where the, I'll say elder, um, is unable to and feels uncomfortable and dependent upon the abusive child or the healthcare worker or the next door neighbor. Um, they're gonna they're gonna back off. They're not gonna want to be um, punished in their minds. So it, it's it's a tragedy all around. Although sadly, with the pandemic, many uh, elders and dependent adults were stuck with their abusers. So we are seeing a significant increase in filings now that people are able to get out a little bit more than they could before. Yeah. So Judges, Judges House, Judges, Judge Hubbard, um, this is Matt. I am going to welcome to our distinguished group of speakers now, uh, Lawrence Lebowski. We're going to ask him to explain a couple of concepts as well. And uh, let's start with um, Larry, what is a private professional fiduciary? Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. A professional fiduciary is a person who acts as a guardian, a conservator, 
an estate administrator, an executor, a trustee, or an agent under a power of attorney, whether that be for health care or financial management, and they do so for two or more non-family members at the same time. A professional fiduciary may supervise a person's care or manage their income, expenses, and assets in the event that that person has impaired mental capacity or passes away, or perhaps just to avoid conflict between family members. Sometimes people prefer to designate professional fiduciaries because they believe that they can more efficiently handle these matters, even though the person is still capable of doing so. Professional fiduciaries do have a wide range and differing levels of experience in areas of care and financial management. As we know, a professional fiduciary, we'll take a look at the next slide, must be licensed by the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau. And that bureau is a part of the state of California Department of Consumer Affairs. In addition to the licensing, professional fiduciaries must also comply with the Professional Fiduciaries Code of Ethics. And it is the Bureau who continues to maintain that code of ethics and may propose changes from time to time. Also, professional fiduciaries are required to maintain good records of their clients' assets. And also they have to file an annual statement with the Bureau discussing their different activities during the year, discussing matters that they've taken on or matters that they're no longer maintaining. Now let's go to the next slide and talk about the specifics of licensing and training. One of the main requirements is that the person seeking to be a professional fiduciary or renewing their license uh, cannot have been convicted of a felony or any crime related to any of the duties that a fiduciary may perform. And they cannot have engaged in any dishonesty, fraud, or gross negligence in performing fiduciary related duties. So the Bureau is strict in governing these applicants and making sure that they have not engaged in conduct which would be inappropriate for a fiduciary. In this way, the Bureau is vouching or vetting for the candidate for licensure. All right, Larry, let me uh, pause you there. I have uh, our next question is for Judge House. Judge House, can you give us an overview of how cases with private professional fiduciaries are different from other cases that don't? All right, well, um, tagging on to our dysfunctional family um, scenario, if you have a private professional fiduciary, you have a, a neutral party, you have someone who's been trained to mediate these sort of uh, scenarios. You also have a private professional fiduciary knows about the resources that are available to take care of seniors. Uh, there's a burgeoning field of ALCPs, which are called aging life care professionals. They know how to get payroll for 24 seven uh, caregivers without having the the federal, the state government, uh, accuse you of wage loss, uh, wage claim issues. In other words, they have a team of people. They have accountants, nurses. Um, they, know, they know what they're doing because of all the training they get. And one thing, I don't know if it's on the list, uh, Mr. Lebowski, but I, as a judge, I love them because they were bonded. Um, so if they did anything uh, nefarious with the money or, or, or the treatment, uh, they risk losing their bond status and that puts them out of business. So um, all, for all of those reasons, it, it, it also, I've done it in these dysfunctional family situations and I've had reports that come back six, 
to nine months later. And they, in fact, um, have cooled the waters, the heat. Uh, they cooled the flames between the siblings. Sometimes what happens is, what I love is the PPF becomes the target. I don't, okay? Um, and that's always a good thing. So um, they're very, very good. The, the, big, the big problem I have with it is it sets up a socioeconomic barrier. There are so many people that would benefit from a PPF but they can't afford them. And I, you know, if there was any funding for any infrastructure program for elders and developing disabled adults, it should be an, uh, an expansion of, of uh, the public guardian so that they can take the place of a PPF funded by um, our tax dollars, because these are some of our most vulnerable citizens. And uh, it, it's with the baby boomers coming into full bloom, there's a huge population of people who may or may not be able to afford a PPF and who actually deserve to have one based upon the risk they're at with their dysfunctional family. Judge House, I'm just going to throw in a, a story very quickly, but the bond is incredibly important. Uh, many years ago, we had suspended when we found out information that perhaps a private professional was taking funds. We suspended, ordered an accounting. That accounting came back saying unaccounted for, for funds of $800,000. That bond paid back the $800,000. Huge amount, very, very significant to that estate. Uh, but the bond did take care of it once that finding was made. As a matter of fact, they were assessed double damages uh, for their breach of fiduciary duty and ended up with jail time, criminal conviction. As well, they should have. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Judge House, for our non-attorney uh, participants and viewers today, you mentioned just now that not everyone can afford the services of a private professional fiduciary and that there should be more public resources. Um, I just want to sum up. Um, we talked about dysfunctional families. And uh, I just want to make sure we connect the dots here that um, the private professional is really useful in families where you have, say, a deadlock between equally situated relatives of the person who might need a conservator Correct. or other surrogate. Um, but can you elaborate on why it is that some people might not be able to afford those services? Why is it only available to some people? Well, um, they charge for their time. Uh, and I've, I have seen hourly rates between 30 and $80, depending upon the complexity of the estate and the complexity of taking care of the person. And by estate, I mean, if they're taking over the finances. But one thing that I've noticed with the, the private professional fiduciaries that I dealt with uh, a great deal is they were very, well, first of all, they have to file accountings every year to explain how they spent the money, uh, what money they took as salary. Um, many of them will uh, farm out the accounting issues or, or the care issues or care placement issues for a much lower amount. Um, so there's, they're required as fiduciaries to be as thrifty and frugal with a conservative's money, um, more so than a family member, that's for sure. Um, so, uh, the, but if you only have a, if you only have someone on, uh, uh, social, uh, benefits, that's not going to cover the cost of, of a, a PPF or someone who has limited pension rights as well. So, um, that's the sad part, um, again, uh, that we're not able as a society to, to assist in that endeavor. All right. They usually well, have a tiered system, too, that we should just point out, that they generally will have the private professional at the top hourly rate, then they might have uh, some people doing bookkeeping, some people doing secretarial. Those are all at lower rates, but they're all still charged. Correct. Now we're going to move on to our next subject, and I'm going to hand over the moderator duties to my good friend, Steve Beltran, and we're going to talk about the concept of court supervision. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Judges House and Hubbard. And it's really beneficial to have judges from two different uh, counties because there are distinctions between the two courts and how they're handled. We've been talking um, 
about estates now and bonds in the context of dysfunction, um, a lot of the questions that we're going to be addressing right now go to the rights of a conservatee, yeah, the personal rights of a conservatee, but they also incorporate the, the issues of bond and accountings. So let's get started this. Uh, would you please uh, open the floor? What is the benefit and what is the concept of court supervision? Judges Hubbard and House, who would like to take that first question. Judge House? Uh, the benefit of court supervision is that we are protecting vulnerable people. Exactly. I mean, that's the mantra of the probate court, protection of vulnerable persons or potentially vulnerable persons. I like to add the potentially because hopefully there's more prevention than there is cure in what we're able to do uh, in the court system. But without a paternalistic approach. Do you see the court providing some structure to these dysfunctional family uh, issues that are posed? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you see court supervision providing a means of structure to dysfunctional families on how to resolve these issues? As if we're watching them, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I think, uh, I don't think, unfortunately that movie, I Care A Lot, did a lot to um, uh, make people very wary of the court probate system. Um, there was so much wrong with that movie. We could do two hours on, on uh. alone. But one of the things that was not highlighted there is that we have court investigators that, for example, when a conservatorship is, is sought, they go out and they interview uh, the cons proposed conservatee. They interview the family members that are involved. If they get additional information, they'll follow up on it. They write a report for the court. And it's very, very valuable um, they, initially because that they're kind of our eyes and ears. They're, they don't have, they don't have a, a dog in the fight, so to speak. They're just to get this information and provide it to us. And they're, they're trained and they're very insightful. Um, after or if a conservatorship is granted uh, on a temporary, or even a permanent basis, they are required to uh, go back and, in fact, uh, do a follow-up every year, I think, and sometimes every two years. I wish they could do it every year. Uh, that's again, another funding issue for a future time to talk about. But then they submit those reports to us and we, they may make a recommendation that we should set a hearing date and have everybody come back in because something's going wrong. Um, a lot of times uh, what we will do, I, I used to take them home on the weekends and I'd have a stack you know, this high, maybe three or four, review them very carefully. Um, and sometimes I would read something that really said, wait a minute, there's something going on here. This wasn't picked up by the investigator and I'm gonna have all these people come back in. Um, so they are sort of our, our eyes and ears after every, to initially guide us in whether we grant a conservatorship or not. And then there, there are eyes and ears afterwards um, uh, in terms of how things are going. Um, so they're, they're very, very important. And there should be five times the number that are, I'm sure in LA and definitely that in Orange County. I mean, I would even ask for 10 times the number if I could. So um, I wish we could. I mean, that's how we do it in, in Los Angeles. Now I don't, in Orange County, I'm not sure how. Uh, each county has their own little um, way of doing this. Uh, some, and it, it does depend on size and resources as well. So how about what goes on in Orange County, Judge Hubbard? Well, our investigators go out of course, uh, as yours do in LA for that initial report to find out what's going on. You should also know that there are just, there are two different probate code sections that set out the role and the duties of investigators. And when they go out, they have to talk about to the con proposed conservative about what their rights are. Do they understand the concept of the conservatorship? Do they want to contest? Do they want counsel? Uh, do they want someone other than the petitioner to act in that role if it's necessary? It's a very lengthy court uh, requirement set forth in those code sections. But as Judge House mentioned, you can they can pass any law they want to up in Sacramento and tell us what we have to do. And if they don't give us the money, it's not going to get done. 
So there are some inspections, or shall we say investigations, on the books that, frankly, we simply cannot do because we don't have the money. And if we don't have the money, we can't do it. Is that similar to Los Angeles County, Judge House? You see that by your experience? Um, well, I not that I see it, but I definitely have heard it, and it's been pointed out. And I think Justice Stratton, who was on the, the who was a supervising judge in probate, would probably jump in here and say definitely more resources are needed, and that our investigators do um, as as incredible job as the time they have, uh, and they're all caring people too. I mean. You don't go into some people's homes on a, a all day regular basis and see that they're suffering or they need help without having having compassion. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think it, it's the same everywhere. Uh, and I'm not sure how pronounced it is in L.A. other than we've always every year asked for more and more and more and re not really have gotten it. It should also be noted that uh, these court investigators may, in fact, be going into somewhat dangerous situations. Correct. These things are not always all that pleasant. Uh, for instance, some of them going into a hoarder's household probably need to wear some kind of hazmat equipment to go into that home to safeguard their own health. So our court investigators go through a lot, and I've never seen them do anything but a really excellent job. According yeah, to I put them in the same category as essential health care workers, police, and fire. Yes. Um, I mean, county employees? Yes. yes. They're distinct then from court-appointed CACs that we'll discuss in, in a few minutes, correct? Oh, absolutely. They're hired by the court as our examiners are anyone else. So their investigations, if it's an initial investigation, say for a limited conservatorship, is there a, a discussion of the 2351.5 powers, the voting rights, uh, anything yes. that, that they take from the proposed conservative? Go ahead, they do a voting, a voting uh, assessment voting, yes. and ask them if they want to vote, if they still understand that process. I will say even if, frankly, down here, even if they say that the person really should be disqualified, we just won't. No, I, I, I had the same practice, yeah. When orders are made, let's say that the investigator's report comes in and a conservatorship is established, hypothetically for a regional center client, all seven powers and voting rights suspended. Is, and then in a year later or two years later, there's a subsequent investigation by uh, the court investigator. And it comes back that the uh, conservative wants to change those powers. Can that be done? Yes. yes yeah, absolutely. Can. Absolutely. They can if, ask if for I, less powers too. Sorry? They can ask for less powers too. So it goes both ways. A conservatorship can start with a certain set of powers, whether it's a general or a, or a limited, correct? Yes, I just wanna reiterate that in Orange County on limited conservatorships, we do not grant the powers to control sexual contacts, re um, marriage, any, we do not grant those at all on an initial appointment unless there's already been an incident and regional centers aware of it. Well, and now that raises another issue. Does the probate investigator communicate with regional centers in the course of an initial uh, assessment and report on a limited petition? No, I, I have not seen that here on our limited calendars. We have separate reports from our investigators and from a uh, regional center. Okay. That's correct in LA. Right. Now, I know it, by my experience in your court, Judge House, that the uh, regional center um, from is better now than it used to be in reporting timely to the court on its recommendations. Um, if you get a report from the re regional center in Los Angeles County and it's recommending uh, for five of the powers, excluding social, sexual and marriage, and the court appointed counsel comes back and says that all seven powers should come in or vice versa. Uh, if the regional center report is that it should be all five, all, si all seven powers, and uh, the CAC recommends all five, how do you handle that? Well, if we get that in a report here, that it's recommended, there's generally again been an incident that would sus substantiate that recommendation. Uh, then I will always ask to talk to the public defender. We have the public defender on our limiteds. Uh, if they agree or disagree with that, most of the time. 
if the regional center has suggested it, which they rarely do, uh, then the public defender does not have uh, a problem with it. If they do, then we're going to have an evidentiary hearing. I think we have to also uh, talk in terms of every case is unique and different. Um, I mean, I, you know, you can, you can say that you, I always say I'm reluctant to do something, but if the circumstances or facts presented themselves that required or uh, were wise to do, then that's something that we would do. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of on board with, uh, with, uh, you know, some of the things that we need to be very careful about and that, and we'll, and, and Mr. Wasserman's going to be talking about that later, but, you know, social sexual contacts um, are, are integral to us as human beings. And just because someone has a developmentally disabled uh, uh, type of lifestyle does not mean that they're not human. So it's very critical uh, to look at those cases on a case by case basis. Let's move now to uh, court appointed counsel, GALs and minors counsel, and particularly court appointed counsel. How are they appointed? Judge House, you want me to take that one? We have sure. a list. We have a list uh, that is through um, our temporary uh, or through our uh, qualifications to put folks, folks on our list. Areas of practice, how long have they been in practice? What is their uh, coverage for uh, insurance purposes? Uh, if they qualify, they're on the list. Again, we pretty much appoint counsel, I would say, on pretty much every case. Uh, unless the conservative themselves are saying, fine, I want this. But uh, do you, do you um, put whoever applies to the list for the list? To, uh, do you grant their applications automatically? How are they vetted? No, that's what I'm saying. They have to have sufficient qualifications. What, what are their areas? How long have they been in practice? Do they have professional liability insurance? Uh, give us some of the cases you've worked on. We look at them, see how they did. Uh, and then they have to requalify actually for our list every year. Judge House? Um, Los Angeles has a similar um, similar procedure uh, with training and requirements. I, I'm not sure it's every year. Uh, maybe Justice Stratton would know, but at least every two years. Well, um, so. it, is there a way to remove a court-appointed counsel? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Bring a petition and get them out of there. Well, well that's another question. How, who files such a petition? Who has standing to file such a petition? And do you, do you do does someone need to file a petition? Actually, yes. again, let's go on the case by case basis. If I read something or I see something in open court, or I hear something that um, uh, was uh, in, in, indicative of some sort of attorney client breach, or some sort of ethical breach, or some you know, you know if or there is an uh, irreconcilable breakdown. Um, all of those, you know, all of those reasons I can on my own remove, I could on my own remove a uh, court appointed counsel. Sometimes it isn't even the court appointed counsel's fault. It's just not a good fit, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and no one's saying that they did a bad job, but it, it, you, you very clearly see that there is a need to have fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would of course make that clear on the record, um, so, yeah, and there are, you know, I, I'll be really blunt. There were times when I was on the court and court appointed counsel acted in such a way that uh, I did not feel that he or she were, were going to ever be effective as court appointed counsel. And um, I may, took the effort to have them removed from the panel. It was rare, but it, mm -hmm. it can happen. So. And I don't think I've seen it in front of me all that often, actually very, very rarely. Uh, a lot of times you're not going to see it in front of you. It's going to be something that goes on outside of court. So the conservative family member, I think, can bring that request to have the court appointed counsel removed if they're just not doing the job. I, I have seen sometimes in reports by a court investigator, and I'll say, counsel, why are you agreeing when I see this in the court investigator's report? Now, in those situations, we may have a problem that's right there in front of me. And I think the people that I've seen bring petitions, and it's pretty rare, but I've seen it, um, are on that in that same cadre of what is allowed in the probate code. 
um, which is, you know, family members. And then there's that, you know, omnibus, any interested person. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say the universe has standing to bring a petition to remove a CAC, but uh, the universe relative to that particular conservative certainly does. We have if, wide discretion in that area. Huge it, well, that's, now, there's a distinction in Orange County uh, that I understand that for limited conservatorships, public defender is appointed. Is that right. person only or person in a state? Well, it's very rare in a limited conservatorship that you have an estate. Generally, if there's an estate in a limited conservatorship, it's going to get put in special needs trust and you don't have an estate. The only other uh, benefits that are usually there are public benefits. And if they have to account to the public agency, which most people do, in that event, we're not going to establish conservatorship of the estate. Assuming you have a PD appointed on a limited in Orange County person only, is there a basis or a means for removal of that assigned PD? Oh, the PD. I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood you for a moment. Yeah. Um, again, if there is an issue, and I've had a couple with the, with the public defender's office, I usually am the one who will note that and set an OSC as to why they shouldn't be removed. If they're not doing the job, they're going to get removed. And, and now you have, and you've discussed already then, I think we're on the par with the two counties, that uh, for general conservatorships, person and a state, you might have, and or a state, you would have a, a court appointed counsel. Is that correct, both counties? Yes. Uh, the only thing I will say is that generally it would be somebody off our list if there's an estate. However, if we determine up front that there really isn't an estate, that will also be the public defender. LA does it from the list on for both the state and person. And now, if, is there a means of reappointment? Let's say that the case has been closed. Is there a means of reappointing a CAC or counsel for a prospective conservative? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Remember I talked about going through the, the stack of probate investigators report. If I'm gonna call the parties in, I reappoint the, um, if, the if the court appointed counsel is still on the list, uh, I'll reappoint that person to uh, you know, go out and interview the, the conservative and then come back in to advocate for the issues that are going on with them. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. Reappointment when there's a problem is critical. We do that also exactly the same. We can also reappoint the guardian ad litems. All right, and now that concludes our portion of it. I wanna transfer back over to Matt so we can discuss matters for the countings and uh, reappointment further and uh, with uh, Lawrence Lebowski. Thank you, uh, judges. Uh, before I uh, bring on Mr. Lebowski, um, I do want to talk about one other subject, which is um, we, we've talked about the important role of the court investigator and of court appointed counsel. Um, there are a couple of other uh, things in couple of other ways in which the court plays a role in exercising control over ongoing conservatorship administration, and I want to make sure we don't neglect those. Um, let's talk about these. Uh, first of all, compensation, and what we're talking about here is compensation of a conservator. A conservator does have a right to request compensation, but um, that is under control of the court. A conservator cannot pay him or herself or itself compensation or compensation for his or her attorney without approval of the court. And that it gives an opportunity for the judicial officer who's responsible for overseeing the conservatorship case, an opportunity to review the conduct of the conservator in office. So let's just briefly talk about that, um, Judge House, Judge Hubbard. Um, what types of things are you looking for when you see a conservator asking for his or her um, compensation to be paid? But also the conservator needs to file a petition, right? Which um, for fees, which all the parties will be able to see and comment on or object to at a hearing. 
Absolutely. And we have very detailed schedules as to what was the income, what were every, all the expenditures. And you've got to give us the date of the expenditure, exactly what it was for, how much it was. Uh, we're very detailed about that. And I know that I, I understand there are some places where if your accounting doesn't exactly balance, that may be okay. I say maybe if your accounting down here was uh, $10 or under off, we might okay it. But other than that, we probably won't. So it goes through our probate examiners, it goes through our probate attorneys, and it goes through me. We have three levels of review. If we catch anything we don't like, um, there's going to be some questions asked and even an OSC set. And I think also uh, with respect to court appointed counsel in, in Los Angeles, they start off having about 10 hours and they have to ask for more hours. So we're able to control those costs. Um, so that's important as well. But you're, you're absolutely right, Judge Hubbard. You, it, the accountings have to balance. So there's something going on. You, you, want, you worry about fraud or theft or embezzlement. So that's a lever that we have over conservators, both professional and civilian. And we will go through that disbursement schedule very carefully. And it's going to be questions about how was this a benefit to the conservatee was this for the conservator, which will not be allowed, of course. So we get very detailed on what you spent money on. Now, um, the next uh, topic here is removal. Um, the court has the power to remove a conservator for cause. Now, that's not the same as termination of a conservatorship, is it? No, it is not. Uh, conservators can be removed for cause. Uh, some of those things might be such as uh, they fail to use ordinary care or diligence, convicted of a felony. That's a big one. Uh, gross immorality. I'm not sure how we define that anymore. Uh, bankruptcy, things of that nature. If they breach their fiduciary duty or if some of these other things have happened, then yes, there's definitely grounds for removal. And I agreed. Is suspension a uh, interim phase of removal? When when would a conservator be suspended? Well, I'll tell you right now, if I don't have an accounting file timely and I don't have a good excuse, they're suspended. Again, it depends on the facts of the case, but um, absolutely. If they're not fulfilling their duty, if there is a risk of a breach of fiduciary duty, they're suspended. Now we, I have set a, a cap on that. I mean, we will give you probably a couple of continuances to get it done. But if by that second or third, you haven't got it done, you're suspended. Now, I want to uh, bring on Mr. Lebowski uh, again for a moment to just uh, briefly explain to us uh, what an accounting is. Thank you, Matt. Just briefly. An accounting is a conservator's report of all of the conservatee's assets that is filed with the court for approval. And that report may also request that the court approve compensation to the conservator and to their attorney. And we ask why a conservator has to file an accounting. And the answer is because it's important to know essentially that every cent is accounted for and that that money is spent for the benefit of the conservatee. So let's go to our next slide. We have some rules on accountings. An accounting must be filed after the first year following a conservator's appointment, every two years thereafter, and when the conservatorship ends. <clears throat> for a small estate, the court can, in appropriate circumstances, waive an accounting. The accounting must show detailed schedules uh, describing assets and values, income, expenses, payments, gains and losses, and be supported by bank statements. All of the expenses and compensation must be reasonable. There must be a detailed report describing the financial activities during the period of the accounting. And the court will set a hearing on whether or not to approve the accounting. Family members in general must be given notice of the hearing and an opportunity to object to it. 
the court will then examine the accounting and any objections and may raise questions for the conservator to answer. So let's go to the next slide. We heard uh, the judges talk about reappointment of court appointed counsel. Appointed counsel is normally discharged when the petition for conservatorship is decided. That does not always happen, but it happens more often than not. The court may reappoint counsel where there is a court proceeding and the court determines that the conservatee is not represented by counsel and appointing counsel for the conservatee would be helpful to resolve the matter or to protect the conservatee's interests or if the conservatee requests counsel. And on the next slide, we have some circumstances that indicate where counsel might be reappointed. This is not a complete list, but there are some examples. If an accounting is not filed timely or the accounting does not comply with the rules in the probate code, if a conservator or a conservatee cannot be located, if a conservator wants to resign or has passed away, if a conservatee wants to terminate the conservatorship, if a conservatee's home is going to be sold, if a conservator wants to request additional medical authority over the conservatee, if the conservator is seeking additional powers, if someone is seeking to remove a conservator and there's a proceeding for that, if someone is seeking to appoint a new conservator, what we call a successor conservator to fill a vacancy, if the court investigator or the judge has concerns or believes that the conservator has not complied with legal requirements. And then the last two are if a conservator wants to change the residence of the conservatee outside the county or outside the state, or if a conservator wants to create a will or a trust for the conservatee. And Matt, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Larry. Um, before we go on to our next subject, I just want to revisit that last lever of uh, court control over the conservator that we brought up earlier, which I think is very important, probably needs to be briefly explained. Um, instructions to the conservator. Um, there are numerous references throughout the probate code, conservatorship law chapters to uh, the ability of the conservator, the conservatee or any interested person to seek instructions from the court on any number of specific subjects. And there's a more general catch-all instruction statute for everything else. Um, Judges House, Hubbard, why don't you explain to us what an order of instructions means? Well, it means what it says. Yeah. Um, we, what do we, I do? Yeah. If they're requesting uh, permission or guidance from the court, which is a safe thing to do, very um, wise. it's very wise to do. It's it's uh, uh, more conservators get in trouble for acting without permission of the court than uh, I've than than any. I mean that they just get in trouble, and they have to justify themselves. And then if they've done something patently wrong, uh, there's surcharges or penalties that can be assessed. So, um, uh, and in the, every, a civilian gets a conservatorship handbook from the court, they can download it from the website. They know what their responsibilities are and um, seeking instructions is the best cover for them um, as well as giving us confidence that the conservator is, is following what the rules are. So. really is the smart thing to do. I recently had a matter where we went to trial and at the end of the trial, it was obvious that had the conservator brought a petition for instructions, all of that could have been avoided. Would have been one hearing, the burdens on us to tell them what to do, done. Yeah. There was I mean, a rather I, I, large surcharge in that matter. Oh yeah. And I think 
you know, when I, when I was raising my, my stepchildren, they didn't want to go to bed at night. So I'd go get the kitchen timer and I'd set it on five minutes. And I said, you know, this timer is going to decide when you go to bed. And it, I'd play with them for a while. I'd go off and I'd go, bad timer, I hate you. You know, and they, they'd hate the timer as well. And they, but they'd march off to bed, no questions asked. Well, you know, in cons- probate and conservatorships, the judges are the timers. Yep. You know, you got to let us know what's going on and we'll make the decision. So, Judge Hubbard, it sounds like in your recent case, uh, it would have been better to ask for permission than for forgiveness. <laughs> would have solved literally thousands and thousands of dollars in litigation costs that were absolutely unnecessary. All that had to be done was a petition for instructions. And uh, these instructions, petitions, they can be brought by the conservator preemptively before they make a decision. They could also be used as a mechanism for the conservatee or a concerned family member or friend to bring a concern to the court about whether or not a conservator should or shouldn't do something and resolve a dispute before it becomes irreparably harmful to the conservatee, right? Exactly. Exactly. Before it mushrooms. I mean, and a lot of times the, the petition would come before me and I'd look at it and I tell my, my, my judicial assistant, let's set this for a settlement conference before, even before we you know, have any hearings on it. Because a lot of times it, it might just be a question of uh, a settlement judge, uh, settlement officer, reviewing what the circumstances are, and then they can make a recommendation or the parties can settle it. Um, and, and that cuts out a lot of litigation and a lot of trauma. Um, you know, getting, getting developing disabled adults who aren't that high functioning or uh, individuals who are in the senior citizen category of which I am, but you know, the, the, the high grade senior citizen in their eighties or nineties, getting them to court is really troublesome. So those are all things that the court can do and will do and should do. So for our Great. next, oh, sorry, go ahead, Judge. No, I said I agree. For our next segment, I'm going to bring on Gavin Wasserman. Mr. Wasserman, are you ready? Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. So in the context of court supervision, we're going to talk about the social, sexual, reproductive, and marriage rights. When you, you break down some of the questions people have about the, the rights of a conservatee once a conservatorship has been established, there's some basic questions they ask. They ask, can a conservatee hang out with friends of their own choosing? Can a conservatee have sex? Can a conservatee have a child? Can a conservatee get married or, or get divorced? And pretty much with everything in the law, you can either say, the answer is yes, but, or you could say maybe, or depends where you sort of fall in analyzing these rights. I like to say yes, but, okay? Yes, conservatee has the, the right generally to have interaction with friends and even strangers to become friends, but that could be um, modified by some court order. Okay, so there was a fair amount of discussion about it, but it's worth bringing up again, is that after the appointment of the conservator, a lot of the day-to-day decisions and disputes generally happen outside of court and are hopefully resolved. Um, if they aren't, then they come back to the court, again, through the probate investigators, the conservative family, friends, or by petition. Previous speakers have talked about sort of a socioeconomic divide on this, and I think that's important, too, because when you have, for example, family members who are the conservators for a developmentally challenged adult, uh, they may not be aware of the petition process, even though they may have been, it may have been explained to them at one point or another. And so for, if there's an issue that's going on, it's most likely gonna come to the attention of the judge through the probate investigator's report. When the probate investigator goes back and asks, how are things going? Um, and asks the conservatee, do you want any changes? Do you want to, do you think, do you want to get out of this? Do you want, counsel. Uh, because between the, those periods of time, you may not necessarily have anyone coming into court. It's only in, in cases where there are ongoing issues before the court, particularly also when there's also estate issues and accounting, that the court is going to be seeing more, the parties themselves or their counsel. Um, and of course, if 
more supervision is a good thing, then how do we pay for it? Let's go to the next slide. The law approaches general probate conservatorships differently than limited conservatorships in their establishment. And I think we've gone over this, that when someone files a petition for a developmentally dis disabled individual's limited conservatorship, they often ask for, specifically ask for the power to control social and sexual contact and relationships of a limited conservatee. That isn't often, and I'm saying generally, a part of a petition for a general conservatorship um, in a dementia situation or a traumatic brain injury or some other reason to be in a probate conservatorship. There are personal rights that the conservatee retains, but like I said, it's not often in the initial petition unless it's a big problem that's facing everyone right away, such as uh, the petitioners trying to keep a individual away from the proposed conservatee because of some sort of abuse, neglect, undue influence, or fraud. Let's go to the next slide. I should also just mention, this is uh, really an overview because these are a lot of concepts and they get very complicated and very case specific. Um, so we said, you know, conservatee retains the right to get married. <laughs> and that is an important sort of jumping off point to come back to the idea of capacity. It's a key concept in conservatorship law, but to understand it, you have to understand there are different levels of capacity for different acts, okay? So someone could have the capacity uh, to marry, but not have the capacity to enter into a contract to sell their home. Next slide. So the way I, I think about this is it's kind of the mental version of the following. You know, a person can have the ability to lift an 18 ounce box of cereal, but they may still also not have the ability to lift a 50 pound bag of flour, right? So some decisions have a lower threshold of capacity. And that's just really confusing when you're looking from the outside in in a conservatorship and saying, well, this, this person is able to do this. Why aren't they able to do that? Why aren't they able to make this decision as opposed to that decision? And that's where you get a lot of these petitions for instruction to sort of decide when these things are in sort of conflict. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So say you have a situation where the conservative doesn't have the capacity to make a, a particular decision or act. Even so, the conservative, if they can express a preference, the conservator has a duty under the law to accommodate those desires, except, and there's always a but or an exception or whatnot, except to the extent that doing so would violate the conservator's fiduciary duties to conservatee or impose an unreasonable expense in the conservatorship estate. Okay, so if, and this is a hard thing because the conservator's subjective view of a decision, maybe that's not a great decision. I don't agree with that decision. I don't want to do it. I don't think you should, but they, ha they have to be able to determine where that line is between the personal thoughts about the decision and their duty to actually accommodate it. Let's go to the next slide. Right, so I already mentioned this about how the limited conservator can get a court order granting the conservator the power to control social and sexual contacts. I think one of the things that came up in the prior uh, speakers was the discussion of how these powers are approached depending on the court. Um, I will also say that in many cases, when you see a, a petition about uh, limited conservator uh, conservatorship, sometimes people are really shy about explaining why they need the power to control social and sexual relationships. So it's, it takes some time to get through to find out what's going on. Go ahead, let's go ahead to the next one. But social and sexual uh, contacts and relationships as a power, as it's set forth, is extremely broad. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think the courts are hesitant about granting it. I mean, you're talking about fundamental rights, but you're talking about them in such a broad brush fashion. Everything between just you know, casual uh, acquaintances to romantic and sexual relationships. So the, even if the conservator ends up with certain powers, if there's a feeling that there's some sort of overstepping, the best person to alert is the probate investigator. We're gonna say that again and again, because they're the eyes and ears of the court and they actually come out. It's not merely pick up the phone and call them, 
if they do come out, budget permitting, um, they're the ones that, that really give uh, the court the on the ground sense of what, what is happening in the, in the real world of when the conservatorship hits what happens at when it's not within the courtroom. Let's, let's go to the next slide. And Gavin, is the court also using expert opinions like geriatric psychiatrists when they're making these decisions as to capacity? Generally, generally, I mean, almost always would probably be the best answer for that. There are some cases where there have been certain issues of, con of consent to conservatorship, but even then, a lot of the courts will want something else. Why is this person consenting to this? But, you know, it gets fact specific. Um, in a general conservatorship, the statute says that the conservator has the care, custody, and control of the conservatee. And there are limits to that. The conservatee retains personal rights. And the personal rights can range from social contacts, telephone, visitor, mail, et cetera. Um, but they're not sort of delimited, which is to say, including but not limited to. There, is, there are so many rights that the conservatee retains, including the right to marry. Let's move over to the next slide. But, but, but the difficulty becomes when we're, again, in the real world in specific cases. So I'm not gonna go through these examples. They're really in your materials for you to think about because you're gonna have a lot of different things going on out there. And although we're trying to give an overview, each one of these, um, we've seen sometimes mixed together, particularly in number three, where you have individuals that the conservative wants to hang out with that are problematic. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so there's a specific probate code that tells us about the capacity to marry. That absent a specific court order, we're gonna have a conservative is presumed to have the same capacity to marry or enter into a domestic partnership as someone without a conservatorship. Next slide, please. There is our definition of marriage in the family code. Uh, I'm not gonna read it. I'll just tell you it's not a very romantic definition, but there we have it, okay? And capacity to marry. So capacity to marry, if you're unmarried, because if you're already married, you can't get married. If you're an adult and you're not otherwise disqualified, what does that mean? Well, one example I, I suppose would be incest. That's a disqualifier, right? The parties can't get married. Next, next slide. Okay. So say there is a question about whether or not the conservative has the capacity to, to enter into a marriage or the conservative is trying to get married and the conservator is in some way throwing up roadblocks. Um, so we talked about how the conservator can file a petition, the conservatee could file a petition, a relative or friend or interested person could file a petition. Go to the next slide. So why would we seek a court order? Well, the conservator may seek the order if the conservatee, sorry, if the conservator that should be is opposed to the marriage. And why would the conservator oppose it? Perhaps the conservator really does feel that the conservatee lacks the capacity or is subject to undue influence or fraud. They may seek the order if they're not sure about what they should do, because they'll send it to the court to determine. You know, and, and other times a conservator might file such a petition in order to av avoid later accusations that they failed to act to protect the conservatee against this proposed spouse who later turns out to be, well, not, not all that good. Conservatee's reasons for seeking court order Pretty simple. I want to get married and they won't let me. Let's go to the next. So why not seek a court order regarding marriage? Well, if you're the conservator and you're part of the family, that's going to make your holiday dinners very bad. There's also a fair amount of expense, of course, anytime you have to go to court on something like this. For the conservatee, if a conservator is hindering their efforts at marriage, um, they might not go to court because they might not be aware they can go to court or they might not have the ability to get it, the issue before the court. Maybe they've decided to get married and there's some, been some gentle counseling about it 
And it's come to the point where they're insistent they want to get married, and, but don't know how to get things moving. So some time may pass before the probate investor comes in, comes into the picture, but that's probably their best option in terms of uh, getting it in front of the court. I have had the situation where when I've been court-appointed counsel and I've been discharged after a petition was granted, later on, the limited conservatee or the conservatee, if they were capable of, of this process, just picked up the phone and called and said, they're doing something. And although I'm not allowed to do things unless I'm appointed, I am allowed to bring it to the court's attention and request reappointment. And that has happened in the past. So sometimes the conservatee has the wherewithal to reach out to somebody. Um, and then there's also unwillingness to, to be evaluated for capacity and the expense. Next slide, please. Okay, sex and the conservatee. Well, let's, let's talk about this. All conservatees are legally adults. Some are sexually active and some would like to be. But what they have in common is if they're all under a supervised conservatorship, you know, how do they have sex? Okay, so our starting hypothetical is uh, conservatives met someone and they want to have a relationship, um, including sex. So what's going to happen? So that's going to depend on a lot of things. Um, we're going to think about what is the conservative's actual capacity and are there any orders in place, right? Um, and then we think about how did those orders or the absence of orders end up working or not in the real world? And it's just because a, a, in an example, a parent has the legal control, social and sexual control uh, over the conservatee, and it's um, not necessarily gonna be the case that they're really in, in the real world gonna be able to do anything about that, right? If the conservatee sneaks off uh, for a rendezvous um, the piece of paper in their hand doesn't mean a great deal. On the other hand, when it comes time to uh, try to prevent someone from seeing a conservative, prevent that contact, having that legal power in those orders can allow that um, conservator to show, for example, if law enforcement were to show up, they actually know this person, I want this person out of my house. They are not an invitee of a responsible adult. The person who has invited them is a conservatee. I'm their conservator. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I think we've already really covered that. Okay. Now we, there was a little discussion about when a conservator acts and when they should go get uh, authorization or a petition for instruction. You know, in the absence of any court orders, in place about the conservative's capacity to make social and sexual decisions, the conservator has no specific legal power to restrict the conservative. But in the real world, a conservator who sees something amiss will likely step in to stop matters. In a perfect system, the conservator would then file an emergency petition with the court or seek a restraining order or both. But I think there's also a socioeconomic divide in that regard as well. Some may not have the resources to do so. Um, Let's see. Let's go back. We've already covered this. Let's go past the next one. So here's an example of something like this. And it's, it happens. You know, the, the sexual partner of the conservatee tells the conservatee, if you really love me, you will have sex with all my friends. And the conservatee agrees. Now, the conservator is going to likely try to take a step to, to put a stop to this. Um, and I think I should also note that, you know, a conservatee, you know, any person, anyone can agree to something, but not necessarily have the ability to legally consent, right? What happens a lot in the cases of um, where an adult has sex with a minor, the fact that a minor has, may have agreed to it uh, with words, supposedly, is not the same as legally consenting. So, you know, the, the fact that a conservative may say, you know, I'm, I'm okay with this, doesn't by itself take a wrong act and make it right. Let's go to the next slide. 
Okay. And again, in, in the real world, the line drawing is very, very difficult. So here we have hypothetical where um, the conservatee has a sexual partner and they are staying over at the residence and loud noises are heard from the bedroom, including what appears to be the conservatee sobbing. Now, what should a conservator do? Now, I'm not gonna give you an answer, but it's, these are really just to illustrate how challenging these things are when they hit the ground. You know, and then I add the next thing, what if you, someone overhears the conservatee yelling, stop? Okay, so next hypothetical. Conservatee is male and has a female sexual partner. Despite counseling about safe sex, male conservatee informs conservator that we don't use anything, it's better that way, okay? So at that point, you have a situation where um, the individual is choosing to have unprotected sex, which leaves them vulnerable to STDs, which is certainly a health issue. And they they're apparently aren't gonna be using birth control. There's also the uh, version five, for example, where you have two sexual partners for which birth control is not an issue, but safe sex still is. Let's go forward. Next. Let's go back one more. All right, sorry about that. So version six is a conservative who wants to, who's a woman who wants to be sexually active with a male sexual partner and the conservator supports this, but insists that the conservative must use birth control. Um, using medical powers under the conservatorship, the conservator has a doctor insert an I IUD and also provides the conservative with condoms. If you think about conservatorships, conservatorships may be the last resort, but even within the conservatorship, you're trying to look for the least restrictive means of protecting the, the conservatee while giving them a chance to exercise their rights. So it's sometimes when you have conservators, particularly parents of uh, maybe an 18 or 19 year old developmentally challenged conservatee, their real thought is actually just to close the whole world you can protect them from issues of reproduction, issues of uh, STDs, et cetera, by simply not allowing them to have sex. But in this hypothetical, we have a conservator who is, the world is open to the conservative to exercise their rights, but is trying to mitigate risks. We can't really know from the outside of the conservatorship a lot of these things. And, so, and the people who are actually inside the conservatorship often don't know, because like I said before, you know, uh, we're dealing with the most intimate parts of uh, fundamental relationships. You know, a conservator is not necessarily gonna be in that room. Uh, and in some cases, things like birth control, the conservative may express some agreement or they may not understand the potential consequences of sex. But sometimes the conservative says to the conservator, I want to have a child for the next slide. And Gavin, just so you know, we need to take a break in a moment because uh, we are going to lose Judge Hubbard uh, to her uh, public duties in just a moment. And uh, I just want to, uh, she was going to be the featured speaker at the beginning of part C. Okay, let's rearrange that. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is go a little bit out of order and um, talk about uh, modification and termination of conservatorships. We will come back to the rest of this very important and interesting subject in a few moments. Um, bringing back Judge Hubbard, as well as Justice Stratton, who I'm thrilled to introduce, and Judge House, welcome back. Um, let's talk about the ongoing administration of conservatorships. We talked about what I call the court's levers of control. Um, in addition to uh, suspension and removal and instructions and control over compensation, let's talk about um, the, the biggest one of all, uh, termination of conservatorships. Um, Judge Hubbard, um, can you explain to us uh, the various mechanisms by which conservatorships are terminated. 
Well, there's basically two by operation of law and then by a petition to terminate. The uh, operation of law is upon the death of the conservatee. Realistically, in general conservatorships where you're dealing with elders, in limited conservatorships where you're dealing with developmental disabled, that does not get better. It generally only gets worse with time, and generally the only termination is going to be by death of the conservatee. There are instances, more particularly I would say for probably uh, dependent adults, where you might have the opportunity to terminate for cause. Basically, they've recompensated, and it very rarely happens. But I think I had mentioned last time I had a gentleman with a traumatic brain injury, and he recovered fully, and it was made my month maybe my year to be able to terminate a conservatorship because it is extremely rare. And um, you already distinguished uh, termination from removal or suspension. So we don't need to discuss that anymore. Um, how about in limited conservatorships? Those are a little bit different, right? Well, basically, it's the same. As I said, if you're developmentally disabled, you're generally not going to improve. If it's a developmental disability, of course, before the age of 18, which covers our limited conservatorships. So again, in most cases, that is generally by death of that limited conservatee. But uh, in a limited conservatorship, uh, it is also terminated if the conservator dies during office as well. What happens in those circumstances? Well, you're really going to get a, hopefully a petition to appoint a successor because the death of the conservative, and we do see this by the way, we have a huge number of developmentally disabled adults who are aging much older than used to be the situation, particularly with like someone with Down syndrome. Um, I actually have a niece with Down syndrome who's now going to be 50 years old. They said she'd never make it past 30. Her mother's the conservator. Who takes over when mom dies? And this is becoming a huge problem for us. I agree with that. So hopefully we've got somebody to come in uh, and petition for that. Sometimes I have seen regional center be able to give a report that says we can help this person sufficiently that you don't need to appoint someone else. And then a lot of times if, if regional center feels they can do that, then we won't reestablish. I, uh, I strongly urge people in limited conservatorship cases to prepare for succession and for the future. Judge Hubbard, thank you very much for taking time to uh, address the public today. It's been a pleasure having you. Good luck. Thank with your you. Family. I wish I could stay longer, but thank you. All thank right. You. Thank you. Now we're going to welcome on for this next segment, Justice Stratton, who has been waiting patiently to uh, have a turn here. Um, let's start off. During the course of a conservatorship, can the powers of the conservator be changed to give them more or less control over the conservatee? And how does that work? Okay, thanks for having me. Um, I want to reiterate before we start that conservatorships are supposed to be tailored to the individual needs of the conservatee. And the principle is that the court should choose the least restrictive alternatives possible for circumstances that um, apply to the particular conservatee. And in that regard, if you've ever seen a conservatorship order, it's very long, it's lengthy, it's multiple pages, because there are, of course, it's, it's mostly boxes that you check or don't check, depending on what's appropriate for the circumstance. So Oftentimes when you start a conservatorship, you're not sure how restrictive it should be or how unrestricted it should be. Um, but the rule is that unless a power is given to the conservator, the power remains with the conservatee. And unless a disability is placed on the conservatee, like taking away a voting privilege or taking away the right to drive, the conservatee remains empowered. So that conservatorship order really sets out the limits of what can be given to the conservator or taken away from the conservatee. And anything that's unstated 
remains as if there wasn't a conservatorship. Now, sometimes an initial conservatorship may prove to be too restrictive or not restrictive enough. And so that's where this idea of adding or subtracting powers comes in. And powers can be added by a petition. A conservator can come in and ask for more powers. Sometimes they come in and ask for less powers because maybe somebody has aged or their physical or mental condition has improved and it's time to be less restrictive. Sometimes a conservatee might ask, tell the investigator, well, I don't like being restricted from doing this. And then the investigator will tell the court in the, in the report and the court may just put it on calendar on its own motion, reappoint counsel and direct counsel to what the issue is. The conservative wants this, that, or whatever power or disability removed and counsel will take it from there. Um, sometimes even the conservative can, can attempt to, to file a petition but normally at that point, the court would appoint counsel to assist the conservatee in doing whatever they wanna do. And so the issue of mod modification of a conservatorship is always, always an option, either at the conservator's request, if the conservatee's request, or because the court on its own motion has decided that this is an issue that needs to be resolved. Um, I'll add that sometimes powers and disabilities are actually negotiated between the conservator and the conservatee. The conservator, proposed conservator may be saying to the conservatee, well, hey, I'm gonna file a conservative, conservativeship petition because I think you need one. And the conservatee may be opposed, may be partially opposed, um, and they may enter into a conversation and a negotiation about what powers the conservator is going to ask for um, and what powers are going to remain with the conservatee. And of course, all of that ultimately has to have the approval of the court, but it wasn't uncommon in my experience for both when there's communication to come in and say, well, we've agreed this power should go here, this power should go there, this disability should not be imposed, this disability should be imposed, or sometimes the negotiation is, well, we're gonna do it for now, but I've promised as a conservator that I'll come back in six months. Um, or I'm asking you now judge to put it on calendar six months from now so we can discuss this particular power or disability. So it's all very flexible with the idea that we're trying to individualize the conservatorship and customize it as much as possible. Um, and so with that, I guess I'll just conclude and say everything sh everything's fluid and should be fluid. And, and that's really something we try to get across to the conservatee and to the conservator, that nothing is set in stone. And that's something that might be uh, quite different and not intuitive to attorneys who practice in other practice areas, civil or criminal. We tend to think of judgments as being very final and conservatorship orders are final judgments and they have all of the finality that attaches to final judgments and yet they can still be modified as the case circumstances evolve and change because they are as individual as the people for whom they are created and even in one individual is not exactly the same person from one day to the next. So that flexibility needs to be built in. Thank you, Justice Stratton. Uh, now let's turn to Judge House. Judge House, we wanna talk about a specific type of power that can be granted sometimes at the beginning of a conservatorship or sometimes added during the administration of the conservatorship and that's exclusive medical authority. Um, um, correct. I'm sorry, you know, I, I know we're running out of time and I, I can be pretty quick. Yes. Um, there are, we've talked about already the desirability of less restrictive options, which can be the advanced health care directive, the power of attorney, the post, which it, it taught, that's your basic DNR um, authority. All the code sections on this slide are there. They should be read. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, 
So if you're looking at healthcare decisions that can be made by a conservator, go to the probate code sections 2354 through 2357. Everything here depends on capacity. So for example, 2354 works when a conservator has capacity, um, but a conservator can still get a court order to require additional treatment if they believe that's necessary. And if you look at the third section, which is kind of a carve out in all of these sections, if the conservator is acting in good faith um, and there's an emergency, or there's pain involved or prevention of serious injury, they can uh, authorize emergency treatment without being liable. But of course, it all hinges on what's in good faith. So the next uh, code, the next slide, um, when the, when a conservative lacks capacity and the judge has said so, those are powers granted to the conservator. I like to think of it as sort of like, you're the adult, the conservative is in the place of the child and you're the one that can authorize the healthcare. Um, what's interesting is if you're, there's a carve out to this um, that uh, the conservator must do what they believe the wishes would be of the conservatee if they know, if not, it's the best interest standard. Or if the, before the conservator was established, the conservatee was a, belonged to a religious order that said prayer, not medical treatment, a conservator must get a treatment uh, by an accredited practitioner of that particular religion. So there are limits there, even when there's general powers. All right, the next slide, Matt. Um, you, there's a lot of things you can't do as a conservator, even if you have exclusive power to order or uh, determine medical treatment. No mental health uh, submissions. You can't go into a mental, can't place a person in a mental health facility. No experimental drugs unless it's done uh, along with the health and safety code. And definitely this would be something where a conservator should seek instructions from the court. Authorization of convulsive treatments. This is electroshock therapy for want of a better term. Uh, I actually reviewed a limited conservator, conservatee's report by our probate investigator at one time. It was a Down syndrome individual. He had had tonsillectomy um, surgery and he woke up and he was a changed person, depressed, wouldn't talk, slept all day. Um, ultimately, um, and this was listed in the investigator's report, no request that an attorney be appointed for him, but I did. And I found out they have to go through um, the health, mental health court um, through and, and get permission uh, as established in the Welfare Institutions Code. So that was something that uh, the conservator parents didn't know and learned by our court investigators pointing it out. One of the big issues with Alzheimer's or a diminished capacity by uh, memory uh, impairment is can you put someone into a secured neurocognitive facility? No. Can you give them medications? No, you have to get permission from the court. Um, and what you're talking about is permission under the uh, code section for uh, treatment of major neurocognitive disorders, which used that's to correct. be called dementia power. Correct, correct. That's what I'm talking about. So yeah, and, and major, it has to be major to restrict someone's freedoms um, and also require them to take drugs. So um, sometimes it's, it's evident and sometimes it's not. Some people are high functioning and have only mild cognitive impairment and no way should go into a secure facility until such time as they're a danger to themselves or perhaps to others. All right. Um, the now, next are one. you also looking to determine if that's the least restrictive means that a secured perimeter facility might not be necessary for someone who's no risk of flight? Correct. I mean, and it, it's kind of, um, you know, you, unfortunately, the judge has to depend upon the, the medical records, the, uh, the recommendations of, the, of their primary care physician or their neurologist. Um, you know, I mean, we had a, I had a circumstance where the, the father was locked in the house and you know, he, the, 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 the caregivers and the daughter wouldn't permit him to leave the house. And the probate investigator saw that not only was it a fire hazard or a fire danger, but they said, you can't do this without court permission. So we held a hearing on that. So um, uh, one of the things you can have is 
uh, we had a question in the Q&A, can a conservatee and a conservator share medical decision-making authority? Absolutely, as long as the conservatee has capacity. And you'll see that um, what in the first code section that I discussed. So um, there's many other conditions in this code section to look at. Uh, we, we can't spend time on them today, but um, it is an important area of the law avoided by an advanced health care directive, uh, power of attorney for medical decisions, um, or again, if the power of attorney uh, uh, is grants a conservatorship that gives these specific um, code uh, powers. Any questions, Matt? I know you had some for me. Well, the, just one left, which is <laughs> even when a conservator has been granted exclusive medical authority, are they still required to listen to the conservators, sorry, to the conservatees wishes and take into account the conservatees desires and preferences? Yes, absolutely. And that's listed in code section 2357, um, where if you're, if you are seeking instructions from the court, you have to under oath say, I have consulted with the conservatee as to his or her wishes. So, um, and, and explain what those are. Uh, so that the judge knows that if the conservatee objects, what the basis is for that objection. All right. Um, I'm going to bring back uh, Justice Stratton for a moment. And we have a, a brief topic of LPS conservatorships, which uh, Judge House, you just alluded to. Mm -hmm. Justice Stratton, what is an LPS conservatorship and what makes it different from a probate conservatorship? An LPS conservatorship is a conservatorship for someone who is gravely disabled because of a mental disorder. So grave disability is defined as someone who can't provide for food, clothing, or shelter for themselves without the help of someone else. But that grave disability has to be because of a, a diagnosed mental disorder. So it's not enough to say, well, you know, you might get somebody who prefers to be homeless and doesn't want to provide shelter for themselves, unless it can be proven that beyond a reasonable doubt, by the way, that that person um, is gravely disabled and is acting this way because of a mental disorder, um, an LPS is not appropriate. So the first thing that the difference between an LPS and a general probate conservatorship is that an LPS conservatorship requires a diagnosis of a mental disorder from what, uh, a mental illness or disorder that's recognized in the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual number five, which is what psychiatrists and mental health professionals use to diagnose um, mental health issues. A general conser probate conservatorship doesn't require such a diagnosis. All it requires is a doctor uh, or a psychologist uh, filling out a capacity declaration and answering questions about the person's general capacity to provide food, clothing, and shelter for themselves and, to or, and or to take care of their estate. But you don't need a formalized diagnosis in the way that you do for LPS. Similarly, and, and because of this, that it's really um, only covers mental illness, an LPS conservatorship is, for, is in one year increments. So if an LPS conservatorship is established, it's established with an expiration date. And if the conservator doesn't come back in before the end of the expiration date and seek to renew that LPS conservatorship, then the conservatorship expires on its own terms. Why is that? Why does an LPS conservatorship for someone mentally ill end, but a conservatorship in probate for someone who's not mentally ill doesn't end? And the reason for that is because in, LP, in LPS, the assumption is that a, a, a mental illness can be managed. It can be treated. And while it may not be able to be cured, there are enough treatments around that can manage it and manage it to the point where the conservatee can get back on his or her feet and take over his or her life again. 
So every year, the conservator is required, if they think it's appropriate, to come back in and ask for the conservatorship to be renewed. And every year, it starts over from scratch. You can have a jury trial every year on a conser an LPS conservatorship if, if that's what the conservatee wants. Um, to see if the conservatee is actually being accepting treatment and managing the illness. In probate conservatorships, it's the opposite assumption. Most of the people on probate conservatorships maybe are aging and they're suffering from dementia or a lot lack of capacity that's that can't be treated well enough to be managed to get them back to the way they were before. Instead, most most people are declining. Or maybe they have a traumatic brain injury that most likely is not going to be able to be treated to get them back to the way they were before. So because the assumption is different, then it's on the then the burden is on the conservator or the conservatee to come in and ask that it, that it be terminated. Another big difference between LPS and regular conservatorships or general conservatorships is the issue of involuntary medication. Normally there's an involuntary medication order that's issued in an LPS conservatorship, which gives the conservator the right to force the conservatee to take psychotropic medication for their mental illness. That is not the situation as Judge House said in a, in a general probate conservatorship. The conservator does not have that power to involuntarily medicate a conservatee with psychotropic medications. And similarly, in an LPS, the conservator has the power to put a conservatee in a locked facility against their will. That's part of the powers in an LPS. For the general conservatorship, the conservator does not have that power. And if it becomes an issue with respect to dementia, they have to come in and get a court order to do that. Um, so a so question I'm very commonly asked by members of the public uh, in all sorts of configurations is, um, I have this relative, parent, child, collateral relative who um, is having this problem and a, a person, a, a friend, a doctor, a police officer, someone told me that I need an LPS conservatorship in order to be able to help that person. How do I get one? Can you file an LPS conservatorship for me? No, and that's a, a huge difference between these two types of conservatorships. The only entity that can file for an LPS conservatorship is the county agency in this, in LA County called the Public Guardian. And it's the public guardian's responsibility to file such a petition. If you have a son or a daughter or a parent or a family member that you think is mentally ill and not able to take care of themselves, you've got to go through the public guardian's office in order to get such a conservatorship filed. And it's really difficult to do that, which is why most LPS conservatorships start with a call of the 911 call by a family member to the police or someone saying, my loved one is acting bizarrely. I'm scared for him. I'm scared for me. Come out and check it out. And if the police come out with or without a social worker in tow and decide to put the person on a 72 hour involuntarily, involuntary hold called a 5150 hold, the police will take the person to the hospital where they will be held against their will for 72 hours and evaluated to see if they do have a mental disorder that's, that's making them gravely disabled. If there is such a diagnosis and evaluation made, at that point, the public guardian will come in and, and likely file a petition. But since you need a diagnosis of a mental disorder, it's hard to get that if the patient or the proposed conservatee is unwilling to submit to a medical examination. So these 5150 holds are the, the usual way that someone gets channeled into an LPS conservatorship. Now that doesn't mean that the public guardian has to be appointed the conservator ultimately. The public guardian may start the process and file a petition 
And then the court will decide whether there's a family member that's able to do it, be the conservator, or whether the public guardian is the appropriate person to be the conservator. Oftentimes, and I've had it happen too many times, a family member may come in and file for a general conservatorship in probate court because they want to be able to involuntarily medicate or confine a loved one whom they think is a danger to themselves or others, or just is, is gravely disabled. And we used to have to tell them, you have to get an LPS conservatorship to get those kind of powers. And they would say, yeah, but I can't get any, I can't get the public guardian to file it. Well, there is a section in the probate code, code 5350, that allows the judge in the probate department to make a referral to the public guardian and ask the public guardian, could you look at this person and see if they qualify for an LPS? But the downside there, that's a great thing because at least we've got the attention of the public guardian and the family couldn't get the, the public guardian's attention. We get the public guardian's attention. They have to come in and evaluate, but the judge can't force the public guardian to file such a petition. And I do remember one particular case where I made such a referral. The public guardian came in with a fabulous evaluation by this, by this doctor who ended up saying, yeah, the person is gravely disabled because of a mental disorder, which is the criteria. And the public guardian said, we're not going to file. We disagree. We're not going to file. And so, uh, you know, without the power to really force such a filing, the family was pretty much left in the same position as being without any recourse. And um, every year in the legislature, there are, uh, and there were this year, bills to try to change that. And pretty much every year they get shot down. And a lot of that is because um, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, there were a lot of abuses with respect to conservatorships, family members using conservatorships to involuntarily confine or medicate their family members. And so when the LPS Act was, was enacted in the late 60s, it was to correct some of those abuses. So people are very hesitant to allow family members to file these, type of, these types of petitions because of the enormous power that comes with these types of conservatorships. All right, thank you, Justice Stratton. You have- Can I jump in for a second? There's a, oh, a, a question in the Q&A. Can a temporary conservatorship of the person be granted while the proposed conservatory is concurrently being held under a 5150 hold or a 5250 hold? Yes. Okay. If you, if you can get a judge to do it, sure. Um, Oftentimes the 5150 hold will be extended. It's for 72 hours. If the doctors think it needs to be extended, it'll be extended 14 days. After that, it can be extended another 30 days. And generally by that time, the public guardian will have gotten it together and decide and probably filed a temporary conservative conservatorship petition on behalf of the person as a prelude to filing a petition for a um, permanent conserv a one-year conservatorship. Thanks, Justice Stratton. Thank you, Justice Stratton. You've covered a, an immense subject that could take a long time to cover it fully and given a wonderful overview. Uh, I want to go back for a moment uh, to Mr. Wasserman because we have been talking in the big picture about the various things that can happen during a conservatorship that affect the rights and the, stati the, the status of the conservatee and another thing that the conservator may have control over as part of the care and custody is determining where a conservatee lives. And also a conservator may be in a position of having to sell assets of a conservatee, including their current or former residents. Um, Gavin, can you explain to us what the uh, statutes governing that authority consist of? Well, very briefly, and this is just overview, is that there's a perception that, that 
oh, no, they're going to be a conservatorship and they're going to sell mom's house and no one will have any control. The, the court does not, first off, a conservatee, um, their home, placement at home is considered by default the least restrictive place for them to be. Now, again, that can be modified by what's in front of the court to show it differently. But before you can sell the personal residence of a conservatee, you need to get author specific authorization from the court. I mean, that's sort of the clearest summary of that. Now, that does happen. And often it happens in the context of there are not, there's not enough money to pay for the care of the conservatee who can no longer reside at home at the level of care they need. But you need to get court authorization. The appointment as conservator doesn't give them the conservator the right to just go out and do that. Additionally, with personal property, if you're going to be getting rid of more than a certain amount, I think it's $5,000 per year, um, selling it, you need authorization from the court as well. I just had a case where we were, were working on that because somebody had multiple vehicles and they needed to be sold. The person was never going to drive again and it needed to be dealt with. With respect to the residents of the uh, conservatee, this is an area where the court actually comes back with a lot of order to show cause hearings is the conservator moves the conservatee but never tells the court. And that really gets judges, probate investigators, court appointed counsel, everyone very nervous because the point of the oversight is kind of frustrated if we don't know where the conservatee is. So the probate investigator comes back and says, you know, um, I, we can't locate them. Then the court is going to set hearings, appoint counsel, do everything possible to find the conservatee. Usually what happens, however, is the probate investigator locates the family, the conservatee, et cetera, but the court still wants to know from the conservator, why did you do that without letting us know? Why didn't you get either prior approval, prior move notice, post move notice? You didn't do all those things. You need to let the court know because just because you got the conservatorship papers doesn't mean you're done. You are still under the continuing oversight of the court. Now, if the conservatee has moved to another county, sometimes the question will be, should the conservatorship be moved to the other county? The conservatee is gonna be moved out of state. Again, in those cases, the conservator is supposed to petition the court for the authority to place the conservatee out of state and let the court know if that's gonna be temporary or permanent. Because if it's gonna be permanent, then the court needs to have something else set um, up over there, an equivalent proceeding, often called an adult guardianship, depending on the jurisdiction. That's the short uh, version of all that. There are mechanisms to transfer conservatorships from county to county within California. There are also mechanisms to transfer conservatorships from state to state, and then existing entirely independent from all of that, there's also a mechanism for a conservatorship to remain within the jurisdiction of California courts, but the residence of the conservatee be changed to a place outside of California, because that might not reflect that the conservatee is really voluntarily changing his or her domicile to another state. It could just be that that happens to be the place where the treatment or the special school that they're going to attend is located and they are being sent there without intent to indefinitely remain in that place or with the possibility of an intent to return. Now we've covered our entire outline uh, and I think we have from when we started about a minute and a half left for Q&A. So I am going to uh, welcome all of our panelists who have uh, made it to the very end and thank the audience for who's uh, hung on to the bitter end. Um, there are a couple of Q&A questions that we've received during the event and there are a couple that we had planned to answer in advance. I'm gonna start with one that we planned to answer in advance and this is gonna go to Judge, um, excuse me, Justice Stratton. Justice Stratton, uh, a subject that we've heard a lot about lately is um, the public access to court records and why in a conservatorship case, some documents are confidential, some other documents might be sealed. Can you tell us about the standards that a judicial officer in the state of California has to follow when determining to make any part of the uh, filing in a conservatorship case non-public and why the legislature is determined to make some conservatorship filings non-public in all cases? Well, 
there's a difference between how LPS and and probate conserv and probate conservatorships are treated with respect to confidentiality. In LPS, there the statute actually provides that all LPS proceedings, written files, hearings are to be confidential. And so, um, for example, if the press came in and they wanted to look at a conservatee's LPS file um, or sit in on a hearing, they would be kicked out unless the conservatee agreed to waive their right to confidentiality. So right now, the LPS conservatorships in L.A., for example, are all done over in the Hollywood courthouse. And generally, before and generally, when you have a big hearing, there'll be several conservatives and their counsel and their family members in the courtroom all at the same time. And before each case is called, the judge will ask counsel for the conservatee, do you want to waive your right to confidentiality of the hearing? And 99% of the time, confidentiality is waived. If it's not waived and the, and the conservatee and his counsel or her counsel want it to be confidential, then the matter will be put to the end of the calendar. The courtroom will be cleared of everyone and it'll remain a confidential uh, proceeding with the reporter's transcript sealed and, it, and an order that it can't be unsealed by order of the court. Um, that's a statute that has been upheld by the California courts um, to preserve the privacy rights of the conservatee. And you can see why. Your mental health records, your medical records are, are very personal. And um, what people say about you and your mental capacity with respect to you having a diagnosed mental disorder is very personal. So that has been upheld. And I'll tell you that when I used to sit over there, Counsel, you know, even lawyers would come in, maybe investigating something, and they'd want to look at the file, and we'd have to tell them, "No, you're not getting the file." And uh, it has been deemed not to be a violation of the First Amendment right of the press. It's been deemed not to be a violation of anybody's First Amendment right to uh, restrict access. Access, but there's no such statute for a general probate conservatorship. However. Um, the courts, at least in LA County, keep certain matters under seal in a sealed file. For example, the capacity declaration is supposed to be a, a confidential document. The screening form that is done on the con proposed conservator because the con pro proposed conservator has to fill out a a form with very private information like their social security number and their criminal record, that kind of thing, that is considered confidential. And there haven't been any court challenges to it. Basically, it's a balancing between the public's right to know and the press's First Amendment rights and the privacy interests of those involved in the conservatorship cases. And the courts are just required with respect to probate conservatorships to make such a balancing test. You uh, alluded to the First Amendment right, freedom of the press, freedom of petition. Um, so overarching all of this, while there are particular exceptions and it is a qualified right, there is a right of access to court records. And that is why unless there's a specific statute for a good for good cause, like there is with the LPS law, uh, going to be a presumption that court proceedings and court records are open to the public, right? Right. And there has been a, a move to um, take the capacity declarations out from under a seal and make them public. And that and it's 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 very controversial. It's been proposed to the California legislature. It hasn't been able to get through. Um, it gets proposed every couple of years. But um, I think most people are very sensitive to having their very intimate personal information open to the public. Um, another question that we have been getting, uh, we've got it in live Q&A today, and it's certainly come up in the past, is 
uh, who addresses concerns about performance of court appointed counsel. And at the risk of hearing myself speak too much, I'm just going to give a brief overview of a few concepts here that we did address in part one, but still relevant. Um, court appointed counsel are just that, counsel, attorneys, members of the State Bar of California or licensees of the State Bar of California. And as a result, whatever we do, I say we because I'm part of that panel and I've represented a number of conservatees and proposed conservatees, uh, anything that we do in that role is going to be governed by the rules of professional conduct, the same as any other attorney under any other circumstances. As uh, one commentator said, an attorney is an attorney is an attorney is an attorney, and that applies here. So concerns about performance of court appointed counsel can be handled the same way as concerns about counsel in any other case uh, and some additional ways. So the, the client for whom appointed counsel is appointed can make a complaint to the state bar as can a concerned friend, family member, interested party or conservator for that person if a conservator is appointed. Um, in addition, Concerns can also be brought to the court because court appointed counsel serve at the pleasure of the court. And as our judicial officers have alluded, when they observe uh, possible poor performance or conflicts or personality clashes between counsel and a conservatee in a proceeding, the court can act, but it doesn't always take place in the view of the court. The court doesn't always know. So there is a place for people to bring those concerns directly to the judicial officer overseeing that case. And if it is something more general, uh, those concerns can also be brought to the supervising judge of the court. Um, however, neither of those mechanisms are currently expressed in our local rules in Los Angeles County. There is a uh, pending revision to the local rules, uh, particularly the, the probate local rules that would actually make it express that those mechanisms are available, which may uh, encourage people to make more use of them. Um, there's a flip side to this that I want everyone to also think about though, which is a, a reason why there might be a complaint or there might be chirping about what court appointed counsel's doing that you know they're not taking into account what the family wants them to do, uh, is how one person put it. Um, is that going to be a basis for the court to act, to, to take any action, to remove court-appointed counsel, replace court-appointed counsel? And the answer is it might not be, because maybe it's court-appointed counsel's job to stand up to uh, those people uh, who are upset that court-appointed counsel is not doing the job the way they want them to do it, maybe because it is the court-appointed counsel's job to be the voice exclusively for the conservatee or proposed conservatee and no one else. Um, I, I'm channeling Justice Stratton here, uh, trying to paraphrase the way she puts it, which is better than the way I put it. Um, but that is a possible reason why the, the court appointed counsel is there to be the voice of the conservatee or proposed conservatee, not the eyes and ears of the court and not the voice of any other concerned family member. So those are our priorities. And a, a court appointed counsel who acts dutifully to those priorities is not doing anything wrong. It might be very upsetting to other people in the case who have other agendas, but that is our job. Uh, with that, I wanna open this up. I know that uh, Mr. Beltran, if he's still here, wants to address this subject. Actually, he might've ducked back out again. Uh, does anybody else wanna address this subject? Well, Matt, I, I think you're right. I was just going to say that, you know, the uh, proposed conservatee is the client and the CAC is their counsel. So um, the conservatee gives their instructions, um, their requests and everything. And the CAC has an obligation um, to be the voice, as you said, and to advocate for the conservatee and the conservatee's wishes. Now, this may pit the um, conservative conservator, or sorry, the conservator against the conservatee sometimes because that is not what the conservator is, is trying to do. The conservator's role is to look out for best interests um, rather than to, um, you know, do whatever the conservatee wants done. 
uh, the CAC's role is to try to get done what the C what the conservancy is requesting. Um, and someone else had asked about uh, whether we could discuss this new bill, AB 1194, um, which is proposed legislation. And, um, you know, it in the bill, it has a lot of re um, proposals to do what the court already does, for instance. If there are allegations of abuse, the court will probably already be appointing um, the, or asking the court investigator to go out and make uh, an inquiry as to what's going on. Sanctions are going to uh, possibly be available as well. Um, this bill also has the PPFs post their schedule of fees. Um, and then there's something else that I found sort of disturbing, which was if the uh, if the conservator brought any action or a request before the court and it was unsuccessful, uh, then the court would have to deny any compensation for fees and costs in such an unsuccessful uh, attempt to make that request. And I thought that would be a chilling effect on the advocacy um, sometimes for uh, by the CAC or by the conservator. Um, I don't know. Uh, are there other comments on that? Well, Sounds like not. Uh, but, so, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> well, actually, it was actually more in the two together with what Matt was saying about uh, the CAC's role, because much like other things we've mentioned, you're not really seeing what's happening. If you have a rare appointment that's a long-term CAC role, you are not going to necessarily see that what's going on between the conservatee and their court-appointed client, what is being said, it's all confidential, what is or isn't being advised. You know, and at what point the attorney is counseling a uh, client against a course of action, right? Because although we are, if we're a court appointed counsel, you are the advocate, a lawyer is a lawyer is a lawyer, is not a vending machine, right? We don't simply push a button and file a petition. We attempt to counsel our clients. And I think the attorney who can't proceed with their client has to, in any, in any kind of case, whether you're doing a conservatorship case or a civil case or whatnot, you need to withdraw in some fashion. And, and that happens too. But I think for CACs, there is also a sense that we weren't appointed to bail. We were appointed to work out difficult situations, work with clients who themselves, from the very get-go, there's an allegation that there are challenges with their, their cognitive abilities. So it puts an, an added burden upon this relationship. Um, but like so much of what's in an ongoing conservatorship, it's just not visible to the eye. And it often it never will be because of the attorney-client privilege. Thank you, Gavin, much appreciated. Um, another subject that has come up uh, recently is um, dovetails with what we've been talking about earlier with the um, social and sexual and reproductive freedoms. Those types of freedoms could all come under what was somewhat euphemistically described by William O. Douglas for the Supreme Court in Griswold against Connecticut as the constitutional right to privacy, uh, which is an, certainly an evolving and interesting subject all of its own. And while predominantly we're talking about conservatorship procedures in relation to state law, conservatorships are exclusively a creature of state law, not federal law. Um, all of us as attorneys and all of our judicial officers are mindful that we operate under and with loyalty to the US Constitution and that we do have to take into account the conservatives' right to privacy. A particular uh, intrusion on right to privacy that could come up in a conservatorship case is uh, putting a conservatee under surveillance. Because that could potentially be uh, done to enforce restrictions on the social, sexual and reproductive freedoms of a conservatee. 
or it could be done for other reasons, but unintentionally intrude upon those rights. Uh, so one of the questions that we were hoping Judge Hubbard would stick around to answer for us, but uh, instead I'm going to call on uh, Judge House to uh, address this. Um, under what circumstances would it be appropriate for a conservator to use electronic surveillance against his or her own conservatee? The only circumstances I can think of would be ones that are approved by the court. Um, you sh if you're a conservator um, and you are engaging in something that, uh, well, first of all, if there was if there was a monitoring of phone calls, well, that's a violation of the criminal law, uh, recording of, of phone conversations without the other person's permission. So right there, you have a conservator who um, has violated the law if they're doing it. Now, you can always, uh, if, if police or a court permits you to do it, then you're not violating the law. But um, this is one of those scenarios where uh, that kind of surveillance is tantamount to placing someone in a secure lock facility because it, for all intents and purposes, it's gaining information that would restrict a person's movements and their social contacts. So uh, there would have to be, in my mind, a very, very strong set of facts that would warrant um, that kind of intrusion into a conservatee's um, uh, uh, life uh, now, and it would have to be based on protecting that conservatee from dangerous or harmful or those around him or her uh, harm scenarios. Thank you, Judge House. So it sounds like if someone had brought this to you in a case where you were the judicial officer responsible for supervision of the conservatorship, you would be looking for notice and you'd be looking for good cause. You would have to be persuaded that this surveillance was narrowly tailored and necessary to protection of an important interest on the part of the conservatees, important enough to outweigh the intrusion on their right to privacy. Yes, you said, it, you said it much more eloquently than I did. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> but that's basically it. Um, you know, I mean, this would be, you know, judges aren't supposed to think about the headlines that their rulings make, but this would certainly be one um, uh, that I would look at because if the headline says something that could be very wrong, then I need to take, I would need to pay attention to to how it could be perceived, um, because that's important for the community to know that we um, are uh, standing up for the, the privacy rights of all individuals, regardless of their uh, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, mental abilities, and so forth. And so that this is the right to privacy is very inherent in, in that protective sort of perception and view by every judge I know. And amazingly, we still have a ton of attendees left. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and implementation yeah. is what's really tricky there, though, because even once you get the order, later you come back and you find cameras at the wrong angles, or you can't, someone has discretion over recording audio or not. You say, well, how do we make sure you can't record audio or you can't turn things where they ought not to be and still maintain the security of? That, that has been authorized. So again, I mean, this is not an uncommon problem that police officers face when they're seeking to, to wiretap or to do search warrants or, or surveil. Um, they, they are required to um, follow the, the Constitution of the United States and the, and the laws of the individual states. So I agree. Um, you know, one of the, the chats I've been, uh, a theme in the chats that I've been getting is, is that you know, Judge House, this is all fine and good. Seek instructions from the court, but we can't get hearing dates for months and months. And um, that's truly a tragedy. Uh, I think what I would like to point out is, and, and maybe Ms. Kesey will follow up, remarks is that, you know, we have a very good system right now. Um, the problem is in its execution. And that is not something the courts have control over. Um, the judiciary is, we're supposed to be an independent branch, but we are dependent upon the people who give us money. 
So, um, and we can't fundraise, we can't advocate um, individually, maybe collectively, but, uh, you know, I encourage um, those who care about this system and the future of it um, to, to join advocacy groups that exist um, to, to fund a, a, rel a, a very good system that only fails because there's not enough money uh, to support the needs of the system. Well, yes, and Matthew, did you have anything else to add? Um, before we wrap up, I wanted to uh, go back to Gavin because we have kind of wrapped around full circle to where we had to abruptly transition. We were talking about uh, certain right to privacy issues for the conservatee. Gavin, is there anything else that you wanted us to cover before we wrap up and hand it over to Debbie for uh, what I like to call the closing argument? Well, uh, the, the slides are there for folks to consider uh, themselves. You know, one area when we're talking about, for example, reproduction in, in the conservatorship and the ability to uh, choose to reproduce or not, you have to watch situations where there's overlap between uh, things that appear to be completely medical decisions that will result in things like sterilization. And that's the conservatorship of Maria B case that's in the slides. And that was a hysterectomy and a removal of ovaries for a medical reason, but the result was gonna be sterilization. And the court had to figure out how to approach this because it, it, what seemed to be a medical decision was going to completely um, to totally obliterate a fundamental right of a conservatee. And I'm trying to, to look at those things, balance those and keep in mind the fundamental rights of the conservatee. It's just an ongoing challenge in the real world. Right. Right. Well, thank you, Gavin. And thank you all for hanging in there. Um, we've gone over, but we hope you have found this program interesting. We hope you've learned something useful today about California's conservatorship law. And I want to briefly recap what we hope you will take away from this presentation. You know, conservatorships exist to protect not to punish. Whenever a conservatorship case is brought, it is because someone, a family member, a friend, or a public agency has alleged a serious concern about the well being of a potentially vulnerable person. There's often serious underlying family dysfunction, though not always. Um, but addressing that dysfunction before it gets out of control is the best way to avoid more conservatorship cases. Conservatorships do infringe the rights of the conservatee, and there's no diminishing that a conservatorship deprives a conservatee of rights. There's room for wrongdoing and abuse. But if a conservatorship is actually needed, then the deprivation of rights should be no more than what is necessary to accomplish the protective purpose. If a conservatorship is not needed, either because it was erroneously filed to begin with or because it has outlived its need, those concerns will be asserted by the legal counsel for the conservatee that they will either retain if they are able or have appointed for them if they are not. Those concerns will be brought to the court and considered by an experienced, conscientious, and neutral judicial officer. Thank you again for attending. Thanks so much to our distinguished panelists, Justice Stratton, Judge House, Judge Hubbard, Gavin Wasserman, Lawrence Lebowski, and to my co-moderators, Matthew Kanan and Stephen Beltran. Thanks to Alex Crudd and the BHBA for hosting this webinar. I'm Debbie Kesey and I wish you all good afternoon. Thank you for joining us.